Okay, we're going to pray and begin. We're on day three at our look of creation and the and uh, Genesis. So um, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are our God, that you're a creator of heaven and earth. And you did it. You did a good job. You did an amazing job. And there is no, no one like you. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us right now. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would bring understanding to the things that I'm teaching. I know that some of them are scientific and really out there, and some of them are a scripture that needs really more amplification. Whatever, Lord, I just thank you that you are God, that you are good, and that you are the answer to our <laughs> prayers and our needs and our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are in day three. Linda! Hey, don't forget your little things. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to fix all of it. Oh. Middle ear too, I'm sure. So, <laughs> nice piece. Cute glasses. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we are, um, I, I just wanted to, um, to open by by talking about randomness, um, that the whole understanding of evolution has everything to do with randomness, and um, the idea of going things going the opposite of the way that they are that science says that they are. Science says that things are uh, second law of thermodynamics is that that things are in entropy; they're going downhill. Uh, evolution says things go uphill. They go from from um, simple to complex. They go from disorganized to organized. Well, that's true in that things went from disorganized to organized when God created the world in the six days. And since then, it started going downhill because man sinned. God did not make it to go downhill. God did not create the world to go to disorder. It's going to disorder because man sinned. And we sinned a great sin. And in sinning, it affected us and our lives, but it also affected everything in the world. Yeah, light is slowing down. We've talked about several of these things. And everything in the universe <laughs> was hinged on that sin. I want to say to you that the sin that we commit even today has huge ramifications. Not maybe as huge as Adam and Eve, but it still has ramifications. It has ramifications to your, um, to your generations. It has ramifications to the people that you know and love. It has ramifications in, in all kinds of ways. It also, your righteousness has ramifications. The Bible says that the sins of the fathers are visited even to the third and fourth generations, but to thousands of generations to those who love him. So our, the goodness and righteousness of the Lord also has fruit, and it is one of those things that will continue to bless. I have stories about that, so do you, I'm sure. Maybe, the, maybe you know some of those stories, or maybe you don't, but there are... Uh, there's good seed that is coming up in your life because of people in your past. My grandmother is a godly woman. I know she planted seeds in me. Even if all she did was pray, she did a lot more than that, but even if all she did was pray, um, she planted great seed in me. One of the things that happened uh, when my grandmother died is uh, in my huge pride and selfishness <laughs> I my first thought was my first thought this is terrible to admit but my first thought after my grandmother died I was now who's going to pray for me <laughs> I mean you know it's just like what you know <laughs> now who's going to pray for me and now I am the grandmother and I have that responsibility to pray and um so it's really important but um but I digress one of the things that I want to have happen in this study is that we end up with an awe of the creator. And I think that you said that, Kathy, that, that when we 
art, looking at all this stuff and these these discoveries by science that it's and and God, it just reveals God is even more vast than we know him to be. It's like, oh, he's bigger than we thought. Oh, he's bigger than we thought. And that's what I really want in the microscopic. He is made manifest in his fantastic, wonderful creation. And also in the universe, in the cosmology. Cosmos, by the, by the way, is the opposite of chaos. Isn't that interesting? Chaos means disorder. Cosmos means order. And so that's kind of an interesting kind of deal. Okay. So creation is a fundam is fundamental to re to redemption. The Bible says over and over again that they are without excuse because he has painted everything in order to give everyone a picture of who he is. And he does that through, our, through creation. He does that through the fact that that tree out there, uh, all the leaves on that tree are, uh, if you counted them, which would be ponderous to do, but if you counted them, it would be a Fibonacci number. I don't know if you know what Fibonacci numbers are, but you can look it up later, Fibonacci. Yes, and then, and then just, because it's fascinating, the number, uh, Fibonacci number is the same is the number of cells in a shell that goes like this, right? And it is in, it's everywhere in creation. I know that the number of leaves on that tree is a Fibonacci number, just because the, num the leaves on every tree is a Fibonacci number. It's kind of like a prime number. It is a, it's something that is, that you can, that you can look at, okay? Anyway, the Fibonacci number of the leaves on that tree is such that the leaves are exposed to the to the maximum amount of sunlight. No leaf covers each other up. It is it, the way that the number the leaves are numbered. It is exactly the way that it needs to be to get the most most bang out of the buck. That isn't that amazing. Yeah, yeah it's just like what? And then and then all this happened by randomness. Now. There is, uh, if I had a bunch of beads, let's say I have um, a bunch of black and white beads. Beads? Beads. No, beads. 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 Yes. Yes, like around your neck, right? And that, and that is. Jan, you're muted. And now you're frozen. I can't hear you. Randomness. Do you think that could even happen? And the short answer is no, absolutely not. It couldn't happen because, because the, it would be, it's totally random. Yeah, that'd be really random. Really random. <laughs> and that it, in its randomness, it made sense. It's, really and ma th let me just tell you mathematically how that could be uh morse code has two they have a dot and a dash right so there's an alphabet of two so um in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth it takes it takes 347 beads in order to have that and that specific sequence is two to the 347th power that means 347 zeros. That's 10 with 104 zeros after it. Okay. 10 with 50 zeros after it is a mathematical expression that in mathematics is called absurd, impossible to happen. So here you've got 10 with 104 zeros after it very absurd <laughs> and so here 10 with 50 zeros that is absurd it is a it is an absurd thing and it, that is not my declaration oh my goodness that's absurd it is a mathematical definition okay so anything with 10 to the 50 zeros after it they say it couldn't happen it's impossible and it, it's a physics definition it's a mathematical definition there's a point where mathematics, they said, there's a point that there has to be a cutoff that, that doesn't matter how many zeros are, it's still 
it doesn't make it any more able to happen. It's less able to happen. So 10 to the 50th is what they decided, mathematics, mathematicians decided that's what the cutoff was. So that is how absurd that randomness, and that is just, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's just that. Let's take hemoglobin. I love this one. Ready? Yep. Okay. Hemoglobin has 574 elements. And the alphabet is not two, it's 20. And it's amino acids and they're specific and they have to be in a specific order. If they're not in the correct order, then it becomes a fatal disease called hemo hemoglobin, hemoglobinopathy. And it okay. hemoglobinopathy. I've only read it, I haven't said it out loud. Okay, 10 with 650 zeros. Wow. Yes. So, yeah. So it's absurd. It's way over 50. <laughs> yeah. So how can hemoglobin happen by accident? Short answer, it can't. Scientists, some scientists, not the ones that I'm referring to, but the, some scientists believe that the, the world was 18 billion years old. Okay. So 18 billion years is only, um, is only, uh, Yeah, 10 to the 18th. So it's only 10 to the 18th seconds long. Okay, 10 to the 18th second. That's a big number, but it's still only 10 to the 18th. That's how many seconds would be in 18 billion years. Okay, so there's only 10 to the 66th amount of atoms in the galaxy. This is impossible. Hemoglobin to just happen is impossible. And hemoglobin has to be, you have to have hemoglobin in order to be viable. If you don't have it, or if it, if you have that disease, then you would die. So hemoglobin happening by accident is like winning the Idaho lottery. Idaho lottery is one in 18 in, yeah, one in 80 million. That's the probability of winning the Idaho lottery, but it's not just winning the Idaho lottery. It's winning the Idaho lottery every day for 90 days in a row. Yeah, good luck. yeah right. So there is planning come to this. God planned so much. Ever been, but it was discovered. But there, on my connection was unstable. Okay, uh, it was discovered, but nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew how to read it. It's re it's readable now, um, but um, it is it's huge, and um, there's three billion elements of hundreds of thousands, 3,000 atoms, could those things happen by chance? No way. No, no way. You're absolutely right. I mean, no mathematician. It's interesting in the um, books that I'm reading about in six days, the mathematicians are all, are all like, this is impossible. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, Genesis. We're going to go to Genesis 1. Verse nine, we are still on the first page <laughs> of the book of Genesis. We'll be there for a while. It's important to understand this. It's really important to understand this. And then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in, into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and he gathered together the waters and called them the seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind 
whose seed is in itself and in the earth. And so it was. And the earth brought forth grass and, and herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So hopefully we'll get through two and three. Okay. That's how long your notes are. And that's why I'm thinking, ah, I'm going to try to. Okay. So day two um, is interesting in that um, it missed a good brand, you know, and that was Monday. Sunday is day one. Okay. Monday is day two. And Monday, God did not say it was good. He didn't bless it and say it was good. Tuesday, though, has a double blessing. The day two, day three has a double blessing. Because of that, most, um, it's interesting. You should just do a study on, and on the third day, every so often, the Bible says on the third day, this happens. And you think, well, what happened the two days before? And what day is it on the calendar? That isn't said. It just says, and on the third day, this happened. The wedding at Cana, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana. You know, so there's all of these on the third day. Things happen with Joshua, the sun stood still. There's all things that, all kinds of things that happen on the third day. And that's a separate study that is just kind of fun to do on your own because it's easy to do. Just look it up on the third day. See all the things that happen on the third day. It isn't necessarily a Tuesday, I guess, but I don't know where, it, where they're numbering from. But, but most Hebrew people, most Jewish people are married on Tuesday because it's the day of double blessing, which makes sense. That's why we have this stuff before. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, <laughs> we, yeah, that's why we have the double blessing here on Tuesday because we have Bible study on Tuesday here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so the second basic law of thermodynamics is that conservation of matter and energy. Energy can be exchanged, but it cannot be created. It cannot be destroyed. So matter goes from one state to another. And in that place of going from one state to another, it, matter can be changed. Solid to a liquid, all of those things. Whenever matter is changed in any way, um, then energy is used to, to do that. And up like that, and that means energy is given off. Okay. And it's, it's called ambient, remember that? That's good, you guys remember that. Um, that's ambient energy. And so some is lost to that. Hot always goes to cold. Duh, we all know that. If it's hot in the room, you open the door and the cold air comes in, right? But if it's cold in the room, you don't open it and let the hot air, I mean, the hot air comes in, right? The cold air doesn't leave, the hot air comes in and the hot air heats the air in, so hot goes to cold, right? And so when the total ambient is achieved, then the work stops. So if the ambient is, let's just say, you open the window here and the temperature outside equals the temperature in, inside, the work stops. It stops exchanging. And because it's come to the ambient and work stops then. As this world is, is coming to a close, there is going to be an equalization of everything and ambient is going to be attained and everything is going to stop. Well, life will stop before that because there's not enough energy to, for life to happen. So this world is coming to an end. We know that scientifically, but guess what? We knew it because the Bible said it way before science said it because Science said back in the day when I was in school, they said that, that um, it's life has been forever, almost it's at least billions of years old, maybe forever, and it's never going to end, you know. And so there was this idea that time would always be, and 
And guess what? I think we mentioned this last week or the week before that um, time will end. Time will end. Yeah. Time will end. And those of us who believe the Bible go, well, of course. You know, you re remember Revelation. You got the Revelation, and there's this eagle that goes, flies through, and says, "Time shall be no more. Time shall be no more. Time ends." Right? Because God is outside of time. And we will live outside of time. It's called eternity. We will live outside of time. And it won't be a multiplicity of days. It will be a different place to be. And it's just one of those things and a long list of things that we've talked about in this class that we don't understand. We can't, I can't fathom living without time. I can't fathom the results of light slowing down. I can't understand how detailed the things of creation are. I just know they are. I don't understand light. I know that it is. <laughs> and, and I know that it has all kinds of consequences. And I think the more we understand, the less we know that we know. Because we're going, oh, this is above my eye or my head hurts now. This is hard to think, right? Because that is what, that's what, life is anyway so um let's just say uh romans chapter 8 talks about paul talks about that we are in the bondage of decay we've talked about that um he talks about in romans chapter 8 talks about our bodies groaning um and we all know that because we're all that old <laughs> if people were 20 in here they go what are you talking about but <laughs> We all know that our bodies are groaning and um, the whole world, Paul says in chapter eight of Romans, the whole world, all of creation is groaning, awaiting the revelation of the sons of God. So um, that's what's happening. We grow old and, and things pass away and there is an end point. There's an end point to all of this. Um, if I were to take um, this is kind of a funny rinky dink example, but if I were to take a, a jar of peanut butter and it, it's, it's unopened, so it's a jar of peanut butter and it's unopened. Inside, there is some matter. It's organic matter inside that sealed jar of peanut butter. Energy can get into that because light can come into, it's made out of glass, so light can come into that peanut butter. Now, if I were to take it op and open it and break the seal, I, according, according to the ways that we were taught in school, energy plus matter equals life. But if I'm going to open that jar of peanut butter, and we've all done it, it's been done millions of times, there's no life in there. There's no new life in, there's no life at all because the peanuts are dead squished and all that, but there's no life in it. If there is life in it, something has broken the seal and something has been introduced into that. Some, it, the thing that's been introduced into that is called in scientific terms, it's called information. So the information has been introduced into that peanut butter and life happens, but life doesn't happen without that information. And so life cannot happen without the information. Who gives the information? Yes. Short answer, God. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty. Anyway, so the food industry on that, and it comes from a previous self, there is life in it. The food industry um, is, has been doing for years and years, about a billion experiments uh, a year for about a hundred years. And they rely on the fact that matter plus energy does not produce life. It never did, not in one of their, uh, one of their kinds of things, unless there was some kind of contaminant or information that got put into that experiment. And at which point that is a dead experiment. It, it doesn't, it's not viable. <clears throat> it doesn't prove anything. What do you so, mean information. Information is like um, a contaminant. 
Yeah. Well, that's okay. Information is a contaminant. Like for instance, oh, if it were, bacteria. if it, yes, bacteria, a spore or something was introduced into the peanut butter. So you open it and goes, well, yeah, there is life in here. It's yucky. Oh, you yeah. know, but, but yes, but it was, it's contaminated because information was added. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So all I wanted to, I use that example because peanut butter is a normal kind of thing that we all do. But when we're talking about things being introduced, that makes it a little bit more understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the dynamic of it, sometimes when you use a bunch of scientific terms, it's like, you know, because I don't, I don't get this. I don't, I get stopped on the term, you know, and yeah. And so that's, so chaos to order is what happened when God created the world. Chaos happened, the earth was out, out form and void. We talked about that. And Erev and Boker is uh, translate evening and morning. That's not a bad translation. Erev means increasing entropy, which means that dis disorder. And Boker is decreasing entropy. That means things are reve being revealed they're being made into order. So God made things from Arab to Boker, disorder to order, first day for disorder to order, Arab and Boker. So creation goes toward order and it does until the end of creation. And actually it didn't stop then. Arab and Boker, it went from, from chaos to order until sin happened and that's when Chaos broke out again. So, okay. So in the Bible, in uh, Ecclesiastes 6, 7, um, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 1, verses 6 to 7, it would be good if I could read. Um, it talks about the water cycle. And the water cycle is something that we didn't understand in, in North American science we didn't understand that in, um, I should say, probably um, European science, Western man, how about Western man science? We didn't understand the water cycle until the 1700s. Um, the um, Egyptians had a form of a water cycle, but it was backwards. <laughs> so they didn't really get it. But the Bible has it frontwards and it's in, it's in Ecclesiastes verse one, uh, chapter one, verses six and seven. It talks about the wind going front toward the south and the wind has a cycle and the rivers flow into the sea, but the sea is not full and it keeps on going like that and talks about the water cycle and that verse in Ecclesiastes and then coupled with the verse in Job 2, 36, put those two together and you've got the water cycle. So the Bible, incidental to its purpose, its purpose is not to do the water cycle. It's not, its purpose isn't to, to describe scientific things. That's not the purpose of the Bible. But incidental to its purpose, it describes all kinds of things. In incidental to its purpose, because the purpose of the Bible is to present Christ and him crucified. What? There is no joke to 36. Oh, all right. I will correct that in your notes and repost them. I don't know what else to do beside that. Yeah, I'll find it. Letters huh? or words of that verse? Nope. Mm -mm. So the Bible, incidental to its purpose, it describes the water cycle, the jet stream. It describes evaporation. And Amos, hopefully this is right, 9.6, it talks about evaporation. Uh, it uh, talks about, in Job 38, it talks about fresh water, uh, springs, springs of fresh water in the ocean. It talks about pathways in the sea. Psalm 8 and Psalm 43 talks about that. All of these things are in the Bible. All of these things are incidental to the main focus of the Bible, main focus of the Bible is, of course, Jesus dying for, for us. 
bringing us back into relationship with God. That's the main event. But uh, everywhere else, it's just like God is saying, you know what? I'm going to speak truth to you guys. Truth here, truth here, truth here, truth here. Matthew Fontaine Mori. In fact, um, Hugh Ross talks about the last, what did he say? The last, I think it's the last four, maybe the last five. Um, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners in science was in the Bible. So and he says, he's so smart, I don't know. But he says, he says, I can tell you what science should look for because it's still, there are all kinds of things that are undiscovered that are in the Bible, undiscovered scientifically. He reads the Bible differently than I do. I don't read the Bible as a scientist, even though, I mean, he can't not read it as a scientist. So, so he comes at it with a very different brain than I have. Anyway, Psalms 8 and Psalm 73, I mean, 43 talks about um, pathways in the sea. Matthew Fontaine Mori was the guy who discovered these. And he saw that in the Bible, he saw Psalm 8 and Psalm 43. He was born in 1806. But in 1825, he joined the Navy and he was put in charge of maps and, um, and uh, the courses of ships. And so he organized the data that was brought to him and he discovered that there was pathways in the sea. And so he's fought the father of oceanography, but why did he have that burning desire to find it? Because of Psalm 8 and Psalm 43. I think that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's awesome. So um, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Let's talk about Job. Um, Job 38. Um, I'm just going to say that 30 times, 35 times in, Gen in Genesis, um, God created and gave the ability and, and the purpose to replicate after its kind. So the whole basis of evolution is that things are not reproducing after their kind. They're changing. And it's, if it is true that that happens, because there are, um, there are changes that happen but they aren't good or viable changes. Those things die. If a person is born with a genetic defect, it's, it's not a good thing. So they say that one out of a thousand is a good, there's a, there's a good um, defect that happens or change in, in genetics, but really that's not provable. They just assume that that might be, and so it's it's taken as a as a as a truth. You know, if you say mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. enough, I'm not going to wax politics here, but if you mm -hmm. say things enough, people see it as truth. And we have lots of things in our society right now: same-sex marriage, all kinds of stuff like that, which I hate even putting those two words together. Marriage. Anyway, if you say it enough, then it, it rings true. That's not true. I mean, it's still not going to be true. Yeah, you can say that the grass is blue and it doesn't matter how many times you say it. It's still green. <laughs> so it's not, it's not going to change. Um, there's, um, in, in Job, it also talks about Pleiades and Orion, which is very interesting. So Pleiades and Orion, he talks about those two constellations. And those two constellations are interesting in that they are gravitationally linked. How did Job know that? That means that what I mean is when you see a constellation, you see stars that are here and here and here and here, and they together make a picture, sort of, and and in and, and they make it, but they're light years away, okay? But Pleiades and Orion are not. They are gravitationally linked. So 
why did why are those the two that Job is referring to or that God is referring to as he's talking about creation? Because it's God that is talking in that chapter. Which, by the way, if you're studying Job, you got to remember who's talking because Job's friends are whacked. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, well, he's the only one that didn't that didn't have to repent before Job. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he's the only one who didn't receive a stern talking to by God. Okay, so I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go that. I'm going to go here. All right, so here we have... For you guys, a mouse trap. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm going to talk about. These five parts of the mouse trap: this, the spring, this little guy that holds the bait, and the thing that holds down the thing before the, before. Okay, I don't even know what these things are called, but spring. I got that one right. Um, but <laughs> other than that, you know. All of those things, if I just have this, I'm catching no mice. If I have all of these things, the platform, that's one, two, three, four, five, five parts to the mousetrap. If I am missing this one, I catch no mice. It's not like I choose, like I, I, um, I catch one fifth less <laughs> because, mm -hmm. because I'm missing one fifth of the mousetrap, right? And I'm trying to get some examples that are, that are going to make sense so that scientifically you can put this into that. I, it's called an irreducible, uh, irreducible complexity. I cannot reduce this. This is complex, kind of. It's very simple, but this is sort of complex. But if I, if I take one part of it out, then it doesn't work. Okay, there are so many things in creation that don't work that there's one part of it missing. Hemoglobin, we've talked about, is one of those things. Okay, you die without certain parts of it. You are not viable. You will not live. It's the same way as I'm catching no mice if I end up without a spring or without the place of bait for bait. It doesn't matter. Or even if I just am missing the little board, it doesn't have very much complexity to it at all. But it has to be mounted on something. So it is called, um, it's called an irreducible complexity. Okay, if I'm missing that part, okay? So it has to have design and that design have to, has to go from beginning to end and it has to be all in one place. Let's take the bacteria. This is where it gets very fun. Okay, I love this kind of stuff anyway. You look at a bacteria under a microscope and it has a flagella, a little tail that goes and it spins and that's how it gets around this bacteria, okay? And where the flagella, teeny weeny thing, because it's teeny weeny, I need a microscope to see it. In this teeny weeny thing, here it is, that is not to scale. I can't see it without a microscope, but let's say it's this long and the tail is this long and it goes like this to get around, all right? From and the tail is connected to the bacteria right here. And in that place is a little teeny motor. And I mean teeny. It's a really teeny motor, but it's not going to work unless all the parts, unless all the parts are there and all the parts are functioning. And then so it has to have it, it is a 40 piece electrical motor that operates the, the rotation of that flagella. Is that amazing? Wow. That is amazing to me <laughs> that God made this bacteria to have this little teeny 40 piece motor. I mean, it's so intricate. Everything that he did was intricate. That can't develop without all of its parts. So it can't just happen. It can't, we've already talked about how things can't come together and just happen. It can't just develop. You know, I'm coming here and I'm getting better. Here, oh, I got another part to my mouse trap. Uh-uh. It, it needs all of it or nothing. Or it doesn't work. The bacteria can't get around without the little motor to flip itself around. 
the fiction is, I think we've said, I said this at the beginning, the fiction is that Darwin started with a simple cell. There is nothing simple about the cell at all. It's easy to see a cell. You can see one with the naked eye. All you have to do is crack an egg and put it in a pan. That is one cell. There's a nucleus, it's yellow. <laughs> There's the rest of the cell, it's white. And you destroyed the cell wall by cracking the egg and, and <laughs> into, into the pan. But it is, it is a simple cell. The biggest simple cell is an ostrich egg, <laughs> but it's still a one. And so we have, we have, we can really study it because it's big, right? It's, you can study it in a microscope or you can do your one cell egg guy. I know this is off topic, but you know, when you're talking about little tiny things that we can't understand, it always makes me think of the hummingbird. How does God make that little bird, that little part of your working to do what he does, you know? And uh, it, just can't you can it. take anything. And reduce, I mean, we can take it just the whole bacteria and talk about that, but we talk about the little teeny motor that's in the bacteria. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, or we talk about our own system and talk about hemoglobin. That's nuts. You know, I mean, just it's it's not the development of this human body, which is huge. We're just taking hemoglobin, which isn't even the totality of your blood. It's just the part that makes it red. You know, it, it's just the hemoglobin. You know, and it's just, anyway, it's just crazy. So it is, how, where am I with time? <gasps> Gosh, I felt like it was. <laughs> okay. I started late. I did start late. Okay. Um, one of the things that we can look at um, plant-wise, uh, no, not plant like this, like a plant that makes stuff like uh, Henry Ford's uh, plant that he did. It's called the River, River Rogue Plant event. Have you heard of that? The River Rogue Plant. Um, what they did, what he did was he uh, takes raw materials in to this plant and out of this plant comes a car. He makes his own steel. He makes his own rubber. He makes everything. He doesn't take any, he takes only raw materials into this plant. It was huge. And new cars drive out and it has 97 miles of railroad in the plant. It really looks like a simple cell. It really has <laughs> all of the components of a simple cell. It has the things that are made and it, and it has conductivity and it has you can, you can walk, it's just amazing. But it is, um, it's just like a simple cell. But a simple cell is capable of replicating itself in hours. And that car is not made in hours. Because <laughs> it has to make the steel and everything else, even just cooling the steel, you know, is wait, not just an hour. It's a process, right. So the great idea, wonderful and amazing thing of man, but anyway, um, let's take um, take DNA. If it is, if you if you uh, make it larger than life, and you make it so that you can wind it up, it would be like 125 miles of line of fishing line. Okay, you scroll it up 125 miles of fishing line is your DNA strand, mm -hmm. okay? And you scroll it up into a scroll, it's gonna be the size of a basketball, okay? Now, in order for that DNA to work, it has to unscroll and copy and then scroll again. And unscroll and copy, I say it like this because it, it splits down the middle and it copies, and scroll again and then scroll and top, and it does it several times a day in your body and in my body. Isn't that amazing? Mm. It's just DNA. That's, that's all it is. We're not talking about DNA and hemoglobin and skin and, and hair mm. and heart and lung and the amazing, just us, 
just how God, but God is personally involved in every cell in creation. It can't happen without him. It's just, it's not like he wound it up and let it happen. By him, all things consist and are held together. They consist by him, but they are also held together by him. So it's just. They talk about the Fibonacci number, but next time we'll talk about photosynthesis and and when we talk about photosynthesis we're going to talk about how it works and all that kind of stuff and and it just as it's replicated after its kind 35 times genesis says that after its kind you will not get carrots out of an apple tree you don't just go out and go Oh, look, carrots grew on my apple tree, not underground. How strange is that? <laughs> I mean, it just, it doesn't happen. And it's ludicrous to think so. But somehow we think that it shouldn't be after its kind, that it should just be replicated in a different sort of way. And it doesn't work that way. All right, I need to close because because we did cover day two, but we didn't cover day three. I mean, three, yeah. We didn't do the, the leaf and the herb and all of that. But we have, mm, yeah. When we have leaf and herb, we have the, the manufacture of, of oxygen out of carbon dioxide. And we have, um, plants uh, that are necessary in order for animals to be and animals that are necessary in order for plants to be. Again, we have a mouse trap. You can't have plants without animals. You can't have animals without plants. It's an irreducible system. That make sense? Clear as mud, everyone? <laughs> I get excited about this, I don't know. I'm glad you guys are still with me and go, okay, Jan, you can be excited. <laughs> oh, it's just a lot to take in. It is a lot, but when we reduce it to not so much, yeah. we are reducing God. He says, let creation define me. Let, I have made you a picture of who I am, a picture of what I can do, a picture of what I've done for you. One of the things I didn't say is there is, I'll say this in the end, there's four Hebrew words for work. One of them is ministry, to minister, to work is to minister. It is, the word in Hebrew means ministry. Second word is artwork. And very close to the third word, which is workmanship. Yeah, workmanship, that's a form of work art, which is another form of work, and ministry. The fourth word isn't even used until the fall of man because it is worrisome labor and pain. Worrisome labor and pain is used when he says to the woman, in worrisome labor and pain, you will bring forth children. It used, it's used to Adam when in worrisome labor and pain, will you till the ground and, and subdue it? in worrisome labor and pain. Worrisome labor and pain is the enemy's answer to God's place of work. So you hear people putting down work all the time, like it's terrible. Oh, I had to go to work today. What is, what is, what happened? 
you're making work worrisome labor and pain. But I guess what? If you don't work during the day, if you don't do something productive, how do you feel? <laughs> you know, like a slug. You know, you just, we are made to work. Mm -hmm. Six days shall you labor and do all your work and on the seventh day rest. So rest is something that's important for us. But one seventh of our time is in rest. The rest of it is in work. Now, my question to you, and the whole reason I bring this up in creation is that that's where it's used, is those four words. Anyway, so when God created, he worked, right? He worked. What word, what Hebrew, obviously not worrisome labor and pain, but what, what are the three words did God use? Was it used in the Hebrew for what God did to create the world? Work, art? Art is art. Yes. Yeah. Workmanship yeah. or ministry? Mm. I know. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> you live with me. You know these things. I discover and I go, guess what? <laughs> you can answer. Ministry. Yes. Mm. Mm. Which, is, which is such a beautiful picture. What did God do when he created the world? is he ministered the word to us. He did it to us. He made everything that you see as a ministry to you and to me. Even if we never see the flower that blooms in the desert, even if we never see the colorful fish in the deep depths of the ocean, it doesn't matter. He made it all for us to minister to us to delight us. I just think that's so cool. Art would fit so well. Workmanship would fit so well. But the fact that it's ministry is delightful to me. And I just think, God, you love me so much. You know, I didn't just paint this for you. I want to minister this world to you. Beautiful. So let's close. Father, I thank you for the ministry of your spirit for the ministry of your son, for the ministry of creation that you did for us. This whole world with the hemoglobin down to the little motor in the bacteria, down to everything else that we've talked about tonight is the ministry of your Holy Spirit. It is your delight to make beauty for us. Father, I thank you for science that helps us to understand and, and delight in these things. Father, I'm sorry for, and I, I just am so um, appreciative of what you do, but that we have slapped you in the face by saying that you weren't there, by saying that you didn't do it, by giving credit to chaos, by giving credit to thermodynamics that says we go downhill instead of uphill, and somehow we messed up with our, even our understanding of this. I thank you, Lord, that you have patience with us, that you still love us despite what we've done to your creation or even how we see it or even how we see you. I ask your blessing, Lord, over us as we, as we contemplate these things. Father, I ask for more and more understanding and light to come to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Is your hand up? Oh, I, that was just, I thought you... I thought your hand was up. <laughs> Do you have a question? I know. Well, the truth is, maybe all, I mean, when I go to research this stuff, the more you know, the more questions you have, the more you don't know, you're kind of going, I don't even know what to ask. <laughs> so.